topic here is how to finance your aircraft. So I'll talk about many of the different sort of uh, financing structures that are going into aircraft now, um, from the airline side as well as from the lessor side as well. Okay, so of course I need to do a quick plug in our business. So our company is Aerotask. It's uh, the only sort of major consultancy based here in Dubai, so we're a home player and this is our home turf. Um, some of the font is a bit off, but hopefully that doesn't throw off anything. Um, so we've had 69 clients throughout our five-year track record. Um, our background stems from an Airbus consultancy, which we sort of migrated out of. We've delivered over 130 advisory projects to date, and we've transacted 68 aircraft assets. So, I mean, our services are on asset management and advisory. We are not a fund ourselves, but we do provide uh, a lot of advisory services and asset management services to those people who do run funds or aircraft investment funds. Okay, so I just wanted to give a, a quick backdrop into why people are actually investing in aviation. So, one of the, I think these slides were similar, and there will be some duplication to some extent uh, with the guys this morning. Um, the main one is sort of the industry's resilience and the passenger traffic growth. So you can see there have been several sort of uh, geopolitical or global, say, catastrophes which have hurt many industries in the world. But you can see with the, the growth in passenger traffic, it has merely slowed down growth and there has not been many areas where it has actually reversed. And every 15 to 20 years, passenger traffic in the world more than doubles. So it's a rapidly, rapidly growing industry and investors want to get a piece of this. So there's many different ways to get in and investing in the aircraft itself is one of the most safe ways to enter this industry. This was a, another graph that was showed earlier today um, comparing real GDP growth against air passenger growth and obviously air passengers is not necessarily an economic metric itself um, but when you compare it to the real GDP growth of the world, um, the air Travel, travel industry continues to grow at a massive pace. Okay, so there's all this growth in the world and there's all these aircraft going to be delivered. How much aircraft are to be delivered? How much is going to need to be financed? And what type of aircraft are going to be delivered? So this is coming from Boeing's research. It's a little bit dated, but nonetheless. Um, there's about 24,000 aircraft out there today, about 100 seats and there's expected to more than double over the next 20, 20 years to 48,000 aircraft. So not all of this is going to be new deliveries, but the great majority of it will be. So you can see 42,000 aircraft are going to be the new deliveries, and that leaves the fleet that's in play today is only going to represent uh, 5,800 aircraft. So there was one question asked earlier whether retrofitting certain improvements is as important as investing in future technology. It is important but it does not have the same production lifespan as investing in new technology is going to have as well. Um, again, it's, it is important, it applies to certain niche, um, uh, I guess, operations, um, but I don't think it's part of the bigger picture in terms of where investors are looking. Um, let me take a look at how much money is then needed to finance these new aircraft deliveries. We're looking north of, of $6 billion. I'd say this is also a, a, a uh, a list price number, so we're probably looking closer to $4 billion. But nonetheless, it is a very large amount of capital that's needed to continue funding the growth of this industry. When we look in terms of the categories of where, where this funding is going, uh, the majority of it's going to be in single aisle aircraft and wide bodies, and less so in freighters and regionals. I'm, this also is for aircraft above 100 seats, so Embraer and Bombardier, don't worry. Your numbers are still there, they're just not shown in this graph. Um, but in any case, the majority of the lessors, and those that are based in this region, which I'll talk about later, are focusing their portfolios mainly on single aisles and wide bodies. And um, some of the, the other consultants earlier today were saying, why are people investing in these and talking about variability in, in uh, residual values? You can see that, if, obviously, if you have a larger fleet, then you have more liquidity and you have stronger residual values, easier to move aircraft, and that's why the majority of people are investing these in addition to the market having a preference for these aircraft types. Okay, so aircraft leasing from the view of an airline is one perspective of financing. So if you're an airline, you can lease aircraft, you can do your own bank debt, you can do your own capital, capital market transactions. 
But behind aircraft leasing as well, these people also need to finance their aircraft. But this is one strong element that's available to, to airlines and something that's been evolving greatly over the last uh, 30 years. So we can see in 1980, sort of when aircraft leasing emerged, the lesser share was only 1.7%. Um, today, it's hovering just north of 40, and it's expected that by 2037, the, the lesser share of the market will be approximately 50%. So this is a massive piece of the market and a massive industry for investors. Um, so if you actually take the growth in the fleet, so you see the number of deliveries expected to grow 3.5%, compound annual growth over the next 20 years. But lessors themselves, because of the growth in the industry and also the growth in their own market share, will be at 4.5%, which is pretty strong growth rate in any account. Now coming, why do airlines choose to lease aircraft? This was touched in some previous ones, so I guess I'll probably brush over the subject a little bit. Um, but one of the elements is outsourcing asset risk. So large airlines do have the capability to employ technical asset management teams in their organization who can monitor aircraft values and make strong purchasing and selling decisions. However, most smaller airlines, this is not something to do on a day-to-day -day basis and it wouldn't be worth investing in these resources. Whereas lessors, this is a major department in their business. So they have teams focused specifically on when it's appropriate to buy and sell aircraft and, and exit at the right prices. Airlines, they have a tough enough time making money as it is, so they don't really want to be taking book losses of assets if they sell at the wrong time. So one way to get out of this is to take an aircraft on an operating lease, and when the lease is done, you return the aircraft with no risk in your book value of assets, and the lessor takes on that risk. This would be particularly true for those aircraft that have higher volatilities and residual values, as um, Ascend pointed out in their slide. So mostly wide-body aircraft would be a big advantage for airlines to offset this asset risk. The other thing it offers is financial flexibility. I think probably until the, the start of this year, actually. So prior to this year, your, your operating lease was not on your balance sheet, so you showed less liabilities on your balance sheet. But coming this year, there's new rules in place where you have to onboard your operating leases. So it's not quite as strong a point as it used to be, but it's still a, still a point. Now, fleet flexibility. So if you want to buy a new 737 MAX, a new A320neo, you're looking at waiting probably five years before you can get your aircraft delivered. And if you need your aircraft now, one of the fastest ways to get in the market is to onboard an operating lease from a lessor who has already placed this forward order and is looking now to move those aircraft. So in some necessary situations, you can get fleet faster if, you, if you're experiencing more rapid growth than if you had to place the orders yourself. So this is another strong advantage that the lessors are operating, offering to the market and why there's a lot of capital flowing into them. The other one is access to capital. So lessors, I would say, are, are better placed to take on some higher risk transactions than our banks themselves because lessors are actively monitoring the aircraft, because lessors have teams who are able to transition aircraft. So there was mentioned earlier that um, startup airlines, um, lots of times they're a little bit strapped for cash. So getting aircraft on operating lease, maybe you pay, if you're higher risk, five times your lease rental. So that may be for a, a new A320, you're looking just north of a million dollars instead of paying 15, 20% equity payment into the aircraft where you're looking at uh, five million dollars. So a much easier way to get access to the aircraft with less capital from your side. Okay, so even behind the lessors, they themselves need to finance aircraft. Leasing itself is a financing avenue for airlines, but there is financing going on in, in behind the scenes. So this is the, another chart from Boeing. It shows over time the different weights in which different financing transactions or financing sources funded Boeing deliveries. So there's primarily four types, and then there's a new one called insurance here, which is sort of a quasi-replacement for another one. So what we can see, there's a few trends that are interesting here. So around and after the financial crisis, um, export credit uh, became a major player because during this time, banks were less able to, they didn't have the liquidity, and they were less able to fund all of the aircraft transactions. And Boeing and Airbus and Bombardier and Embraer still needed to find a way to finance their aircraft. And they relied on their government banks to help back these up, either by lending directly or providing guarantees to banks who would then lend to these aircraft. But you can see that around 2015, 2016, it's uh, fallen much off the wayside. Um, this is due primarily in part because the major US uh, export manufacturer 
Uh, XM is, is not able to do deals of the size that are required for aircraft transactions. Airbus has had some issues itself. So it's created the inability for ECAs to operate, but it hasn't been such an issue because there's been a lot of liquidity in the market and a lot of people looking to finance aircraft. And so bank debt and capital markets have easily sort of plugged the gap. Um, one new item that's sort of come to the table is insurance, which has been sort of a, because of the problems with Exim, insurance has emerged. So what insurance does is it provides somewhat of a similar product as, as Exim did in terms of guaranteeing loans. There's a consortium of insurers um, called AFIC that basically will provide insurance backing on sort of non-payment of the, of, the, of the airline to a bank who will then lend to the airline. So it has sort of filled the gap or created a, another avenue in which, because export credit cannot function at the moment, it has still allowed a similar type of structure to come into play. And then the last remaining one is cash, um, which is mostly related to the, the equity investment in the aircraft for people buying aircraft. Okay, so just jumping into these, uh, this region is quite active itself in all of these types of transactions. Um, you can see that on the sale lease back, Investec has financed Emirates 100 A380, which is, when I come back to, to risks, I think it's wise of Emirates to do sale and lease back, sell as many A380s as it can, and let somebody else take that residual value risk. As pointed out, um, by Peter earlier today, um, the potential variation in A380 residual is plus minus 40% across what's predicted. So maybe you make money when you sell it, maybe you lose a lot of money. <coughs> we can see um, typical bank funding transactions for Fly Dubai, Emirates launching a Sukuk, which is a capital market style transaction. I'll actually go back a slide because I didn't touch on capital markets that much. So, Capital markets are a traded security, traded on some exchange somewhere. They take many different forms. A sukuk is one of them. Um, it's a type of Islamic structure of a bond. Um, there's also ABS transactions, WETC transactions. But these types of, of transactions are more typical of very strong, very large, very credit worthy airlines. And often these transactions require a credit rating themselves in order to be launched. So you're seeing most of the capital markets transactions happening in the US, where there's strong access to the capital markets, and in Europe. Less so in, in Asia, and less so in the Middle East and Africa. Okay, so, so most of these other ones I spoke about earlier were, were airlines accessing finance themselves. But behind, behind that as well, you have the aircraft lessors. So DAE is by far the largest aircraft lessor in the Middle East. Um, it's about 360, 370 aircraft. It has its base here, it has its base in uh, Dublin where it acquired AWOS, um, and it has bases all over the place. And they've, they've uh, acquired a 535 million loan facility to finance further growth. Um, Saudi also accessing loans. And then IASC, um, another lessor base here in Dubai, also tapping into Sukuk financing for their portfolio. Okay, so I will briefly talk about some of the transactions themselves. Um, admittedly, I'm not an expert in Islamic financing, so I can't get into too much details behind the Sukuk here. Um, but Emirates did issue a Sukuk for $600 million, um, which has a coupon of 4.5%, paid semi-annually. Basically, it's a, it's, this type of transaction is not attached to specific aircraft. It's not necessarily used to fund aircraft, it's if you fund other corporate purposes. They issue a coupon payment to the lenders twice a year. And then the Sukuk amortizes over, over its tenure of uh, just shy of 10 years. Okay, so this, this might be a bit more interesting, a bit more relevant for airlines in the room, especially if we have airlines from Africa here. Um, you're looking at a, a traditional bank financing for aircraft deliveries. So Ethiopian ordered um, five, seven, three, seven, eight hundred aircraft. Obviously, it's not going to pay for these all in cash. It's going to access some, some type of financing. There are many of these avenues available for it. So in this case, they got the traditional sort of senior loan, which is what you normally get from a bank. But they also have a junior loan on top of that. So the difference between a senior loan and a junior loan, the senior loan has sort of the ultimate security. It gets paid first. If anything happens in a case of default, the, the senior loan has the rights. 
the junior loan still has rights, but it's subordinated to the senior loan. So whatever is left, if everybody defaults, belongs to the junior loan. So it takes on higher risk. But in return for that higher risk, it takes on a, a higher interest rate. And there's, there's funds specifically set up to invest in junior loans. Some of those funds actually based here in the, in the UAE as well. So with Ethiopia, they tapped into both of these. So they covered almost the entire purchase price of the aircraft with debt, requiring very little capex from their own side. And even the insurance company I was talking about before, AFIC, provided an insurance policy covering the risk of default to these loans. So they've tapped into both traditional bank debt as well as into the insurance market. <coughs> So one thing that's interesting with AFIC, and which we see happening in the future, because I know a lot of the, the, the regions in the world are not of great credit, and they struggle, struggle accessing uh, bank debt, and leasing is not necessarily the thing they want to do either, because it can be quite expensive, especially with, with regards to maintenance reserves and other items that bank debt typically wouldn't have. Sure. I actually thought I would fly through this pretty quick and not have much time left, so <laughs> I can move through pretty quickly. Um, but AFIC, for example, offers a insurance of the debt and therefore de-risks the debt almost entirely to the lender. And in certain places in Africa, I expect eventually when AFIC matures, that they'll be able to issue insurance policies for more challenging areas. And that places like maybe Ghana or Nigeria or other places in Africa will be able to access a broader range of bank debt with the backing of AFIC. So something to keep an eye on. It's not there yet, but I think it will happen in the future. Okay, so this is a, a typical export credit deal, um, one that we were actually involved in to some extent. So this is a Bombardier sale of aircraft to an airline in Africa. Typical risk that a normal bank would not want to take. So the ECA steps in and takes on the majority of the risk. So they don't lend directly into the aircraft. What they do is they, they set up a special purpose company, just Casey Cayman. Um, they lend into this special purpose company. The airline lends into the special purpose company. The manufacturer sells into it, the special purpose company leases it to the airline. So the airline gets what it needs in terms of access to debt, but it doesn't own the aircraft until it's fully paid off the lease, which is a financial lease structure to the SPV in the middle. And that way, the bank is protected that always has ownership until the, the lessee, or in this case the airline, fully pays its commitments, and at which point it has a $10 purchase option to then take the aircraft. So the export credit agencies are quite sophisticated themselves and they don't necessarily just give you the money because they want to sell. They structure their own uh, transactions as well so that they're well protected. Okay. Yes? In these sort of deals, what, what are the insurance costs? Um, this was not a... This one was not an AFIC deal, so this was not insured. This was uh, basically uh, ECA deal straight to the, the um, airline in the end well, through another company. I'm not sure what the insurance is priced at. Um, it would obviously be some type of risk-based insurance. So in certain less risky airlines, less risky locations, the insurance premium would be less. Just like any type of insurance, the higher risk, the higher the premium. Thank you. So I expect when it first comes into certain parts of Africa, it will be very expensive. But over time, after the market is more known, there's more data points, it will, it will level off to something more reasonable. Okay, so I think there's not much time left. Two minutes. Okay, so I'll whiz through these. But basically, now to aircraft investment funds. Um, I am not a fund manager, so I don't know all the details behind the fund itself, but I can, I can set up for you the general fund structure and how it works. Um, these were all covered, basically, in the previous sessions, why people are jumping into aircraft investments. Um, obviously, they want to tap into the growth of, it, of air travel, but they don't necessarily want the high risk that is involved when you invest in an airline directly. So they want another way to get into it, and what better than real assets. So the way I look at it, investing in aircraft is sort of like investing in property. You have an asset, you get a rental. From that rental, you pay off your debt, and at the end, you hope for some capital appreciation of the property when you sell it, and you make a return on this entire string of cash flows. Okay, so this would be a, a typical fund structure. It can be much more complex, but this is sort of a simplified version. In this version, I have a separate fund and a separate fund manager, or a separate lease manager. So the example here is you have a fund which is launched by an investment bank or somebody very specialized in the fund. 
but then you also have a lease manager who is somebody like IFC here in Dubai, DAE Capital, uh, Novus, who actually manage the fund from the lessor point of view. So they provide the procuring of the aircraft, they negotiate the leases, they negotiate the purchase agreement, they manage the deal and they dispose of the aircraft at the end, and the money flows back up to the fund. Um, the SPCs, the fund typically owns either a head special purpose company with many special purpose vehicles under it, which all in turn own aircraft, some may own multiple ones, but it typically depends on the, the structure of the financing. Those SPCs own the aircraft, they get the debt from the lender um, in return for security, they lease the aircraft to the lessee in turn for lease rents, um, they purchase the aircraft from the seller in return for the aircraft. The purchases can be in many different ways. They can be buying aircraft from Boeing and Airbus directly, waiting for them to deliver. They can be buying a portfolio from existing lessors to get a portfolio running up and quickly. They could be buying end-of-life aircraft from the secondary market, parting them out, and then returning the funds to the, the investors that way. Okay, so there's some key local players here in the, in the UAE. You have DAE Capital, which is by far the largest. I've just put some sort of general um, observations about them. You have IAFC, which is a lease manager. It manages a fund called Aleph. You have Novus Aviation Capital, which is also a manager, managing its own money and other people's money. And Novus also has these junior debt funds, which I spoke about earlier, to take a higher risk um, debt transaction, but make, make more money from it. And you have NCB Capital, who recently, NCB is actually a fund, and they have partnered with Aircap, who will be the fund manager for their fund. So you can either be a fund manager, you can be the manager yourself, in the case of these two, or you can just be the back-end financial fund and have another lessor manage it for you. So there's many different ways to put together the structure. Okay, so this is my last slide, but this just explains sort of how the fund will be repaid. So this is a typical A320 transaction. Uh, very simple, I've just done the major cash flows. So you've got an acquisition price around 44 million. You acquire debt funding about 80%. That's your equity you need to pump into it. So that's your first year zero cash outflow. Then your yearly cash flows, you have lease rental of say $300,000 a month. Um, you have a debt repayment and you have a, some type of monthly cash flow or yearly cash flow. It can be paid half yearly, yearly, depends. And so you have a constant cash flow to the investors over the life of the lease. Now the interesting thing is you actually make, you can make or break your entire investment in the end. And this is what Peter was, was saying earlier in terms of the variability in the residual values. So this particular investment makes a 11% IRR, but that's totally dependent on this residual value, the exit value of the aircraft at the end. And if you don't achieve that, maybe an A380, maybe another wide body, maybe a particular situation where you haven't had good oversight on the technical condition of the aircraft, your IRR could very much be zero or negative as well. Um, the final uh, exit value being the disposal price here. In this case, no, you cannot sell a 12-year-old A320 for 28.5 million, but you do have your cash reserves, major reserves, which are in addition to the sale price. You pay back the debt, which would be typically a balloon at that stage, and you've got your equity cash out. And it produces this type of uh, cash flow for you. So. You put in 8.7 million, you get out 26.2, your net cash is 17 and a half. Your annual yield is about 6%. So if you've invested 8.7, you get back 0.5 each year. 200% um, return overall, but that's over 12 years, which gives you about 11% IR. And I think most people would argue that's a bit high at the moment, uh, given the amount of capital that's flowing into the industry. But this is just a, a typical example. Okay, so that's it in terms of um, investing in aircraft, financing them, and fund structures from my side. I'm happy to answer any questions anyone may have um, now and after as well if you'd like. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you very much. Uh, do you have examples? This is obviously uh, fixed wing. Yes. Commercial fixed wing. Do you have examples? Does this model also apply for rotary? Yeah, commercial it, it definitely does. Um, there's, Can there's, you give examples of that, please? Um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but there's a, there's a large lessor specifically focused on rotary wing, and they themselves will have the back-end financing that's just the same as this. Um, we've done appraisals for rotary wing helicopters that go into traditional bank financing. So the bank needs an appraisal so it knows what it's lending against in terms of value. So yes, it's, it's very much the same, just on a smaller scale. 
Okay, any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much for the, your, your uh, talk there. It's very interesting. My name is Mark Spicer. I'm a startup airline called Blue Sky Airways in Botswana. And I'm very interested in this um, fund insurance, uh, lending insurance thing. And I, I understand it's very new here, but is a, a lot of that based on the uh, rating of the country or mm -hmm. Uh, you know, what, what criteria would they look at? I know you mentioned Africa, it hasn't quite come here yet, but Botswana, as far as Africa goes, is one of the highest rated, you know, as far as stability goes. And I'm just wondering, also, does the, does the uh, borrower get this insurance, or does the, uh, the banks, in this case, get the insurance? The, the borrower will pay for the insurance, but the policy is issued to the banks. Okay. Yeah. And the, the metrics will be a mix of your country risk, your airline risk, and also the asset risk. So be much, you'll have a much lower insurance premium if they're doing an A320, because they know if they do get it back, it's easy to move, than if they're doing a 777 or an A380. Um, but it is a combination of all of them. And I don't know their exact calculations. I'm pretty sure um, that's their own proprietary information, but it would be based on those, those sort of pillars. Would that be based only on new aircraft or with uh, used aircraft also? I spoke, I spoke with them and they said it doesn't necessarily need to be new aircraft, but that's, they're starting, they're very new. The consortium is only a couple of years old and they're starting with the lower hanging fruit, which is going to be new deliveries of Boeing aircraft primarily. And then after they sort of tested it and tried it, they'll start moving into other aircraft types and into used aircraft, but I think that's still a ways away. So if you're asking whether AFIC is going to provide an insurance to lenders for you for a startup in Botswana. My honest view is it's not yet time for that. Why does everybody say that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Some more questions, please. I just would like to take this opportunity to make our session more interactive because we, because we just get the information that our next speaker is being delayed. Let's Sorry. talk. <laughs> so I have a lot of questions, yeah? Yes. Attack Mr. Woods with the questions. Hello, oh, sorry, the lights did not give me a chance to see your hands. Hi, Rob. My name is Andrew from BCA. Um, it's just a quick question about what, something that you touched on earlier, which is the, the change uh, due to the IFRS 16 in terms of how airlines are required to hold um, lease assets on their balance sheet. Um, that was a fundamental shift in terms of how things are built. What's, what's your view on how that's going to affect it's, the leasing versus financing market? Yeah, it's a fundamental shift in, in reporting, but it's not a fundamental shift in the economic value that leasing provides. So instead of investing five million to get access to an A320 five years from now, you're only putting in one million to get access into it six months from now. And the way you report on that is not going to change the benefit that that brings to you. Um, it will create some issues in terms of um, airlines who have debt, which have loan covenants on their balance sheet, needing to maintain certain ratios. Now that all the assets come onto the balance sheet, it may throw those off. And there's definitely going to need to be some cooperation between the financiers and the airlines in, t in terms of understanding this. Um, but I don't think it's, it's going to be a harm for aircraft lessors at all. Um, they just keep continuing to grow. Um, also, I think it's going to be an advantage for our business anyways, because we have to do a lot of sort of, when we do an analysis or evaluation of an airline, we have to bring all the operating leases back onto the balance sheet. And so now this work will be more or less done for us, subject to the assumptions they make and bring those uh, assets onto the balance sheet. Thank you, and we have one more question. Hi, I'm uh, Todd Siena, the founder of Block Aero Technologies. So my question is about your point on the residual values and uh, um, when you do not properly uh, monitor the technical condition of the asset. I've heard from numbers from like IATA uh, that it, the average cost is uh, exceeding $1.6 million uh, per lease return. And I'm wondering if you could go into more detail on like what those, uh, uh, what's creating those losses and how that happens and who ends up paying for that and uh, how those disputes get resolved, just as much as we like to talk about it. Okay. Interesting. So, in your aircraft lease agreement, you will have a set of redelivery conditions. 
which state typically your airframe must be free and clear from any airframe heavy maintenance over the next 18 months. Um, your engines must have at minimum uh, 3,000 cycles remaining. Your landing gear free for the next 18 months. APU, same type of thing. And if you do not meet these conditions as an airline, then you need to foot the bill to bring the aircraft back into a condition where it can meet these conditions. The purpose being, the lessor has delivery conditions to the next person and needs to be able to transition it efficiently. So there's typically a 12 month period be before the aircraft is returned that the two companies start working together on meeting these redelivery conditions. But it is the lessee who needs to foot the bill to cover all of these discrepancies because contractually they need to bring it to a certain state. Um, they do have maintenance reserves that they would have, well, hopefully, or not, depends on which view you take, uh, been paying to the lessor, and they could tap into these in order to fulfill certain lease return conditions, provided that they're not performing the work prematurely. Uh, this is where the majority of these uh, lease return costs are coming, for, coming from, is in this premature work on heavy maintenance that wouldn't have otherwise been required if you didn't have the return conditions. And coming to sort of values, because these return conditions improve the value of the aircraft because you restore a sort of a zero life landing gear to full life, you get an extra $500,000 value in your aircraft, something like this. Um, you look at an A320, um, the value of its sort of maintenance reservable components is probably 14 million, and it's delivered new at say 45 million. So about 25% of the value of the aircraft is depending on its maintenance value. So you can have very large swings in residual value depending on where the aircraft is in its maintenance cycle particularly if you're looking at an end-of-life aircraft, where its entire value is its maintenance value. Um. Thank you so much, Mr. Watts. Thank it's you. our pleasure to have you in our session. And, uh...